women to be involved in STEM careers, and why does it even matter? I'm Jill Horner. This is Comcast Newsmakers. With me is Dr. Mel Chiavelli. He is president of Harrisburg University of Science and Technology. Thanks Good so much be for being with us. Good to be here. Let's talk about the STEM careers. We're talking about science, technology, engineering, and math. This is exactly what Harrisburg University focuses on. But talk to us about women in these careers. Are women starting to participate in these careers at a, at a greater pace, or are they still lagging behind their male counterparts? Oh, they're definitely lagging behind. Matter of fact, if you talk 10 years ago, you wouldn't be talking about women in science and technology careers. You'd be talking about white men in science and technology careers. Because uh, as it turns out, for some unknown reason, in the middle schools somewhere, age 11, 12, 13, uh, it isn't cool to be uh, a woman, or for that matter, a, a minority of any kind, uh, isn't cool to be good in math and science, uh, peer pressure and other things. And so there is a pipeline issue with regard to the number of, of uh, women uh, who want to study science and technology. It's not a pipeline problem of women going to college because 53, 54 percent of college enrollments are women. It is a problem of women who are motivated to study science and technology. And long term, why is it important to have an equal number of women in the workplace in these fields? It's very simple. Why should we throw away half of our minds uh, which in areas which make us nationally competitive with the rest of the world uh, and which provide remarkable for family sustaining careers uh, for people. So you mentioned a pipeline issue, but let's talk about this at a higher education level. Are there steps that can occur at a university level to address some of these issues? Obviously, there are, there are issues associated with the pipeline with elementary, middle school, and high school levels, but what about at the university level? Well, universities have to support K-12 teachers. And one way that you can support a K-12 teacher with regard to keeping an interest and a motivation is to run programs that bring that uh, age student through a university where they can see uh, female role models in, in laboratories, where they can see the neat stuff that goes on and continue to maintain the motivation, which is, which is usually very high in, in sort of the fifth, sixth, seventh grade, and then starts to decline after that. So we run summer camps, we run, we run visitation programs, we bring uh, uh, many, many uh, students through uh, just to try to make sure that they understand that uh, if you want to be a scientist, you're not going to be stuck in a, in, a, in a room with a white coat not talking to human beings ever. It is very, it's a very human endeavor. And so if you can show people that and if you, if you can keep them excited about it, uh, then I think that's what universities can do best and support teachers. And are there certain areas where there needs to be even more focus? For example, uh, medical professions, there seems to be more women uh, participating at this point, but are there certain other areas where there needs to be more of a focus? E engineering is, is, the case, is the place where uh, engineering schools very, very few, under 15 percent women. Harrisburg University, for example, has 53 percent women and 44 percent minority students. So. Uh, our programs are such that they uh, are, are conducive to that uh, enrollment and, and that uh, type of individual. Can women faculty, female faculty, make a difference? No question about it. If you had a role model when you were young and, and you saw yourself being that person, then you, there's nothing that's going to uh, prevent you from, from moving on. And we just have a short time left, but you mentioned the idea of summer camps. Why can this make a difference? What does it mean to have young people participating in programs like this? Because you get to do neat stuff. <laughs> you, you, get, you get to be there and actually handle, handle real things, work on real problems uh, in a s less formal setting than walking in the classroom every day and listening to somebody uh, talk uh, in front. The way most people who are good in science learn science is by doing it not by hands-on things, not by keeping your hands off things or just listening to somebody talk about it. All right, and make science fun. That's, that's part oh, of it. Oh, absolutely, yeah. All well, right. it is. All right. Thanks so much for being with us. Good. We've been talking with Dr. Mel Chiavelli. I'm Jill Horner.